We're going to continue into a series that we started two weeks ago. And, and before I, I give a little bit of a recap, I want to read from the text that we've been reading. And it's in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. And in verse 4 through 6, this is a moment when the disciples are talking to Jesus. They're at the Last Supper, as we know. And, 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 and Jesus is speaking and sharing what's about to come. And in verse 4, we capture this moment where he says, you know the place you know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So two weeks ago, we kicked off this series reflecting on these powerful words that Jesus spoke, that he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And these words encapsulate the very essence of our Christian faith. And, and I believe it and invites us to explore more deeply what they mean for our lives and for all humanity. We've, we've talked about how these words of comfort and hope are courage to those who have Jesus that they're conviction for those who do not have Jesus, but overall they are clarification for all mankind. Whether we like it or not, this text leaves no room for other paths, whether you believe in the Bible or not, but overall the choice is yours. In week one, the first week we talked about how Jesus is the way, how he is the narrow way. Way. The narrow way is a way of action. It means we must leave behind everything that God points out to us that will hinder us from walking on this way. Our own reasonings and ideas, our belief in our own abilities, relationships that hold us back, status, honor, pride, those must be counted as a loss and left outside the narrow gates. There is no room for them on the narrow way. And last week we talked about the hard truth. Jesus answered Thomas that he is the truth. That each of us are capable of knowing truth, but none of us can claim to actually be truth. There are too many things we don't know and too many things we get wrong throughout our lives, yet Jesus claims to be truth. And in doing so, claims to be one with God. Jesus can testify to the truth and teach the truth because he himself is that truth. And in him there is nothing false, nothing misleading, nothing fake or uncertain. See, uh, your truth will only get you so far. Coming in contact with the truth brings transformation to our lives. Our attitude towards the truth determines the outcome of our lives. If we don't love the truth, if we resist it, we resist salvation. But if we do love the truth and we embrace salvation and we receive the reward, which is the crown of life, eternal life. There is a truth about who we are and about who Jesus is. The truth gives hope. How many say amen? Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 16 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I'm going to jump to John 8, 32. It says, Then you will know the truth, and the truth will what? The truth will set you free. I, I'm, I'm taking a slight detour from John 14 this afternoon and, and our journey from the way, the truth, and the life. I, I need to go back in a timeline of the journey with a message called The Miracle is Always Moving. Write that down. The miracle is always moving. The miracle is always moving. Moving. I hope that's encouraging somebody just right now as we say those words. God's miracle is always moving. It's on its way. It may have arrived. It may be right in front of you, but it is always moving in Jesus' name. Come on, let's prepare our hearts and minds right now. Father, we thank you once again for allowing us to be here in your presence, in this place with our friends, family, new friends, new family. Father, we're grateful, Lord Jesus, for all that you've already done from this morning and now leading into this service. We ask you, Lord, that you speak, that let it be about you, that people put their focus on the way, the truth, and the life that is you, Jesus. And we're grateful and thankful for what is about to happen in Jesus' name. Come on, we say amen, amen. amen. I, I read this one time before in Psalms 118, 24. Maybe you've heard this. It's a, it's a pretty a, a, a famous saying, but it says, this is the day the Lord has made. What does it require after that? We will what? Rejoice and be glad 
in it. Could you imagine believing that like every single day? That this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice. When you say we will rejoice, you are making a conscious decision that no matter the hell that's happening around me, I will rejoice and be glad in it because God, you made this day. You are the creator of heavens and earth. You are the creator of me and the person I don't like right now. You are the creator. So this is the day the Lord has made. I choose to rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know if that changes the dynamic of how your day may have already started this afternoon. To say that, God, this is your day is declaring that no matter what happens, you are still on the throne. You are still in control. You are, God, the one who says the final word, whatever the sickness is, whatever the bad news is, whatever text I just received that took me out of my peace. God, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I sounded mad. I didn't sound I was happy. I like the message translation says, this is the very day God acted. Let's celebrate and be festive. Salvation now, God. Salvation now. Oh, yes, God. A free and full life. Man, what a declaration. It's literally saying that I, some of y'all need to start your day like that going forward. Forget the message. Some of y'all needs to specifically every day say, Lord, Psalms 118, I have woken up. This is the day the Lord has made. Toddler hanging on your side, screaming, this is the day the Lord has made. Arguing with this person. This is your boss walks in. This is your work starts stacking up. This is why is it that when it's all in negative moments is the times where we either run towards God or we resist completely completely and run away. Which one are we? Do I choose that it's God's day when things are going good? Like, God, you're in this. God's in it even in the bad. Life, you know, is made of defining moments. What will yours look like? You can have weeks of routine, things being the same, but at every point of time in your life, when you're getting ready to move into a new level, you have to have a defining moment. See, defining moments are seasons in our life where things change. Defining moments are moments that define our future. Defining moments are orchestrated by God's purpose that in all things, he works together for our good. See, if I say this is the day the Lord has made, we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm believing that in due time, what I'm speaking will come into existence. That in due time, what I'm speaking will start penetrating within the inside of me. That no matter how sick I may be or how, however, however it, it, it may be, the bad news may be, whatever turmoil I'm going through or difficulty I'm going through or stress that I'm going through, what I'm declaring, saying, God, this is the day you have made. This is the day you have made. Last year uh, in, our, in our Revive conference, we had Pastor Nick Nielsen from Lakewood. He came, he gave a word to Revive that it's due time. And it was beautiful because he gave that word and literally a month or two later, we just started seeing such a massive increase of people and salvation and just team and, and everything was growing saying it's due time time, right? Due time, meaning it's an opportune moment. And, and he talked about how there are four seasons uh, that, that, that are in life, which is what? Spring, summer, fall, and winter. And in this state, we have the honor to experience all four seasons in one day. I don't know if that's honor at all. That's just like, man, it's bipolar. That's what that actually means. But for believers, we have five seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter, and due time, meaning it is time for God to do something in these moments. And I'm believing as, as the journey that we have been taking throughout this month of Jesus moving towards the cross over something that, has, that we already know the answer to. Could you imagine sitting already knowing the end of the movie, but you're watching it with excitement because you can't wait till that moment. That's us sitting in this room. We know that Jesus is alive. We know that he rose again. We will celebrate it every single day of our lives that he is risen, that he is within us still to today, that the power that rose him from the grave is the power that's within inside of us in this very moment. We don't have to wait till the end of the movie to celebrate something that we already know. When he says, this is the day the Lord has made, we already know we won. So we rejoice. 
Now, I, I want to go to Genesis chapter 46. If you can go, um, if you're new to the Word of God, it's the first book, very first one, whether you have uh, pages or if you've got to turn yours on. But it's in Genesis chapter 46. I'm just going to read the first four verses. And it says in verse 1, So Israel set out with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac, and God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father. He said, Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. He says in verse 4, I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Those who know the word, that's kind of like a repeat of something he already said before that he's reminding him of something that he, that he promised his, his grandfather. And here's, here's the thing. When God is going to do something wonderful, I've seen where a lot of times we start with hardships. Have you ever been in a, in a position in your life where it's like, if, if you're a mature believer, I'm, I'm speaking to mature believers that spiritually understand where God may be taking you in the moment where you're believing, you're, you have faith in the unknown. You, you, you're walking by faith, not by sight. And some of you are like, yeah, that's not me. No, no, it's okay. I, I'm talking about what's that? That when something all of a sudden arrives into your life, you think to yourself, God, you're about to do something. Is there anybody that's like that? The positive people. I'm talking about the people that, that you're next to somebody and you receive bad news all together and you go, don't worry about it because my God is in control. Do you have people that are like that, that are around your life, right? Uh, sometimes it's difficult to really have that type of faith. And some of us, we may be scared inside. We're just saying it. We're just like, God, I know you're in control. And you're like worried in the inside. This is, hasn't happened yet. Why is this happening? Whatever it may be, but you're saying, God, you are in control, right? I, I've seen that when God is about to do something, something wonderful. Sometimes you start with a hardship, but when God is about to do something amazing, you may start with an impossibility, but I believe that overall he will do it. You know, a couple weeks ago, we had an awesome married couples panel here, and, and it was a beautiful time together with a lot of married couples from our church, and we got to hear uh, representation from different married couples up here that were married for many years, some early years, and, and it was awesome seeing their stories uh, uh, come out from, from everything that they've been experiencing, what God has done in their lives, and, and one of our core values here at Revive is family. I believe that a healthy church is, is, is fruit from healthy families, and, and we are believing in strong, healthy families here at Revive, and whether I may not have a spouse or, or have children, you are in the house of God. You're part of his family. This is a family where we've come together to encourage and build each other up, so we're believing in family, and, and, and couples celebrating many happies together often recite their hardships. They relate these with solemn joy, for those are the times that built their relationship and bonded them together, right? My wife and I, we've been married 21 years, and we've gone through some stuff, right, man? You know, if you're married under five years, yeah. you know, it's just nothing against it. Keep going. Keep pulling through because I'm five years or whoo. That's, that's, the, that's, the te that's like a testing period, right? Some of y'all are like testing, is she the one? It's already too late. Like, you're already married. You know what I'm saying? It's like... But what I'm saying is that there's things that you go through. Maria and I, we can talk about some hardships that we've experienced financially, uh, 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 in our health, and in different things that have happened in ministerially, uh, in, in our, and professionally, uh, personally, whatever it may be. There's hardships that we can talk about. And how we responded to those hardships a lot of times is what's brought us either closer together or has brought us further apart. And that's where a lot of times divorce starts happening because when we made that promise through thick and thin, through, for better or worse, were like y'all just playing when y'all said that? Was it just kind of like for better or worse, unless, right? No, no, it's for better or worse, right? It's literally for heaven or hell. That's literally what you're saying is I am with you until the end. Now, I, I'm not trying to, you know, uh, uh, put a stamp on, on, on things that, that may, you know, you're being abused, physically abused or whatever it may be. It's, you need, it's time. That's not Okay. What I'm saying is that if you're in a marriage and a simple argument has brought us so far apart that we're not talking for three days, that's a major problem, right? All right this is not a major marriage conference. What I'm trying to say is in hardships, 
a lot of times it brings relationships and bonds them together. See, my wife and I this afternoon, uh, we're more stronger than ever because we experienced a hardship just two days ago. We were working on our front yard. That's what we were doing. And so from 1 p.m. on Friday to about 11.30 last night, I didn't sleep at all. No, I slept. <laughs> we said we were literally digging it. Just how many have already started? Y'all started on your yard? How many are feeling conviction right now that you need to start? Is there anybody here? And we were in there and just, I'm just <laughs> like, you know, labor, right? And, and my wife's position, right? Because her love language, I remember that, is acts of service and quality time, right? So for her, acts of service, quality time is the embodiment of me holding a shovel and digging roots out for 12 hours. And as I'm digging roots out, not weed, because we were replacing shrubs. So I'm like, tell me, Jesus, these are 10 year old shrubs. Like, you know, I'm just transferring. And I'm looking and I look up to my wife and she's like, I'm, you know, every time she's like, isn't this so wonderful? And I was like, I'm the one over here, you know, just, and she's like sitting there drinking her tea, you know, no, no, she was working. She was working too. All right. It's funny how what we may look at as a hardship, someone else may not look at as a hardship, right? Uh, obviously it's what we had to do. And, and the Bible story of Joseph takes us from the book of Genesis on a decision of what his father Jacob had to do in order to kickstart something that we celebrate today. And it's one of the most heroic redemption and forgiveness stories because Joseph was one of the most loved sons of his father, Israel. He was given the famous robe of many colors. When, when Joseph reported having dreams of his brothers and even the stars and moon bowing before him, their jealousy of Joseph, Joseph grew into action and the brothers sold their own brother into slavery to a traveling caravan of Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt and sold him to Potiphar and the captain of Pharaoh's garden and it went on and on. And in Egypt, the Lord's presence with Joseph enables him to find favor with Potiphar and the keeper of the prison. And with God's help, Joseph interprets the dreams of two prisoners, predicting that one of them will be reinstated, but the other put to death. And, and then Joseph then interprets the dreams of the Pharaoh, which anticipates seven years of plenty and, and followed by seven years of fan. And, and Pharaoh recognizes Joseph's God-given ability and prompts his promotion to the chief administrator of Egypt. Such a beautiful redemption story of starting as a slave to now being in charge of an entire nation. It, it's, it's amazing how what I could be looking at in my life today and what God could be doing and trying to produce and produce or prune and produce out of me to take me to a place of promise. And in Egypt, the Lord's presence, or, or now in Genesis, sorry, in Genesis 46, Jacob, or at this point in the story of Jacob, his father, was convinced that his son Joseph was in Egypt. Him as, a, as the father, his brothers had no idea of what happened to their brother other than they sold him and he's maybe dead. And so this is where we pick up, pick up in Genesis 46, He's ready to move his family. He's excited about seeing his long lost son. And Jacob packs up everything he owned and left for Egypt. And on the way, he stopped near the town of Beersheba and offered sacrifices to God. And that night, God spoke to him and said, Jacob, Jacob, I am God, the same God your father worshiped. Don't be afraid to go to Egypt. I will give you so many descendants that one day, they will become a nation. I will go with you to Egypt, and later I will bring your descendants back here. Your son Joseph will be at your side when you die. What a beautiful, just such a reassurance from God to Jacob of a decision that he's about to make. And God reiterated Jacob's family promise, which was the, the, the blessing of Abraham, to reassure him that he was doing the right thing, meaning, yes, you are doing the right thing by packing up and leaving to Egypt, because what I'm about to do with that decision is going to go beyond you. I love it when God gives us reassurances. Have you ever felt like that peace where it's like, God, thank you, I'm in the right place. I'm, I'm in the right state of mind. I'm, I'm where you need me to be. Because they don't always come as we live the life of faith. But they do come when we need them the most. And Jacob clearly needed it. So what, what does this mean 
for us today, I, I believe the first one is that God knows what he's doing. That's why for us, as we, as we prepare in the next two weeks to celebrate something, really, uh, it, it's a celebration for us. Some people have said it's the Super Bowl of Christian faith. No, no, we're not. What I'm saying is that it is, it's a moment. It's a, it's a marked moment, a marked date that, that pretty much the whole world globally will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And no matter how you feel about Easter bunnies and egg hunts and all this stuff, uh, the, the, the primary thing that we're trying to do here is celebrate something that we should be living every single day. It's like a marked moment. Some of us, uh, like I said, uh, maybe if you watch, how many have watched the movie The Passion of the Christ, right? The one that Mel Gibson did. That's a raw movie, right? It's rated R for a reason, but it's hard to watch again. You watch it one time and it leaves you like, why? Because it brings to reality something that we easily read through text and maybe don't get a revelation of how ugly and nasty it was, the resurrection or, or the crucifixion of Jesus, and so for us, emotionally, it'll hit us in a way to be like, oh my God, my Savior, someone who I have a relationship with, the one who loves me most, went through that for me. So when you see something like that, it moves you in a way to be like, oh my God, like you want to get saved again. You're asking for forgiveness for sins you know you've already been forgiven for. You get into a mode where it's just like, Lord Jesus, it's an emotional toll to see our Savior be crucified in such a gruesome way. It wasn't just pretty and, and nice. It was, the Bible says they couldn't even recognize him by the time he was on the cross. That's how much lashes and beatings and, 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 and just all that he went through. That, that when he bled and they pierced him, water came out, meaning he had no blood left in his body. That's how much he bled. That's gruesome. And we're like, we got to be careful. We're going to put the little baby Jesus out there for, for the ride kids. Put him up there. He's like, look what Jesus did. And they tied him on the cross. You know, he's like, yeah. You know, what, what I'm saying is that it's something that's brutal and, and, and it should move us. It sh we shouldn't have to wait till two weeks from now to really take into account what he did for us. It should be an everyday humbling moment to say, God, thank you that you took my place. It should have been me. Thank you, God, for still being by my side. Thank you, God, for your sacrifice. Thank you, God, for sending what you loved most to save what's, what he loves most, which is us. God knows what he's doing. God is sovereign. He has a grand plan for your life and he helps you along the way. He nudges you here and he pushes you there to make decisions that line up with his best for your life. See, we have to get to the point where we trust God even when we don't know what he is doing. And in the case of Jacob and his family, the Lord used Egypt and the wealth of the Egyptians generated during the 400 years they had Jacob's family in bondage to become the money used to, to later establish the nation of Israel. So don't fret when things don't look like they're, they're going your way when things look like they're working against you. God has a way of making everything work out for your good by his grace because he loves you. And the second one is to embrace the grace. A lot of us don't want to preach grace, right? But embrace the grace. I've said it before in this way, embrace the grace to thrive under pressure. See, some people buckle under pressure. Others seemingly embrace the pressure and thrive under it. Which one are you? See, the people of God in Egypt exponentially multiplied under pressure, and you can do the same. Ain't that something? Don't ever think you can't take it. Don't ever allow the enemy to cause you to feel like that what you are facing is too much for you to handle. If you're facing it, could it be that God can trust you with it and he has already given you the grace to overcome it? When all is said and done, it can work out for your good even and it will give you a great testimony. I've, I've had so many people ask me, how is it that you balance your life? How is it that you are husband? How is it that you're father? How is it that, you're, that, you, that you run a, an entire team? How is it that you run a church? How, it is by his grace. To be able to function under pressure is by his grace. There's moments as I'm preaching, God starts depositing things in me. Remember this in staff meeting on Tuesday. Remember this. We have to talk about this. Remember, oh my God, this is a message for May. There's things you have to be under his grace in order to thrive under pressure. We have to embrace it. And say, God, you have me here. You have me here. It's what you want me to do. And the third one and final one for you is the miracle 
is always moving. You know, I'm sure the descendants of Jacob question whether or not the blessing of Abraham was still in operation while they were in bondage to the Egyptians. Could you imagine that? We've heard that from Abram, Abraham to now Isaac, Jacob, to say that I will make you into a great nation, but I'm a slave in Egypt. How does this look like nation? And it's great. We're all slaves. Is this what you said when we were to come together? And, and we could be in a position like that, and we will always have moments like that where God's saying, God, this is not what you said. Hold on. I remember the word that you gave, or, or not necessarily, and I'm not talking about just some prophetic word that some prophet said, I'm talking about what his word says, that it says, if I am more than a conqueror, then Lord, what am I conquering today? What is it that I'm trying to occupy for your kingdom? What is it? I don't see nothing happening right now. Could you imagine how the Israelites felt under slavery, holding on to something that was given 400 years ago to say that we will become a great nation? I'm sure frustration set from time to time, and I'm sure they did not know what was going on, and nor did they understand the big picture. But God was still God. His plan was still in motion, and his blessing was still working. See, we must trust God, and we have to believe that his blessing, his miracle is still working today. Even when you have no idea how it's going to work out. That's when we sing songs about the blood of Jesus, something that spilled so long ago. We're still believing something we tangibly have not touched with our hands still can touch our lives and transform us. You have to believe it's going to work out. You have to trust God when you can't trace him. When you face a difficult situation, don't buckle under the pressure. Embrace God's grace to overcome it. Believe it's going to work out for your good. And no matter what it looks like, always know that God is, God's miracle is working in your life. And it's working for your good. See, one of the most dangerous things about ministry, and even just coming to church, is that you can be in the house and get lost or feel lost. I remember time sharing this with, with you leadership many years ago, where you're in what would be his presence. We, we've heard the things where two or three are gathered, he makes presence, but you're standing here, sitting here, and you're like, I don't feel anything. All I feel is my sadness. All I feel is the difficulty. All I feel is what I have to do tomorrow. I don't feel what you're feeling. And what happens is some of us, we've become so apathetic to the move of God. And we've become apathetic to what his word says. And we're just like, you know what? I'm, it is what it is. I'm just here. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. This is, but if you're here, it's amazing how we can be in the place and still feel lost. You can be serving God and still go astray. So glad you're listening to our podcast, and we're believing it'll bless your life. And our desire is to impact more souls with the gospel of Christ. If you want to join this mission and want to give today, we will be so grateful. And you can do so by visiting our website at www.revivekaleen.com or text GIVE to 844-462-9071. Now let's get back to the message. You, could, you know, part of being a follower of God is recognizing that you are in a bad place. To be like, ah, this is not good. Like, my life is not where it should be, or my walk with God is not where it should be. And, you, and it's just a personal battle, a conversation you have with yourself where you're like, ah, man, I should have not went that week into this, or I should have I said no. I should not text her back. I should not went to her door. I should not walked in, right? There's a lot of you don't want to go in, right? You, just, you, I, you, you, you love God. You know about God. There's some people here that don't have a relationship with God but can quote scripture greater than me. They'll just say, I've had conversations with people that don't believe in God. I don't go to church. I, I don't believe in faith communities. I don't believe in none of that stuff. I don't, I don't believe in, in just nothing. No fruit of the spirit at all. It's just a dead conversation. But they will be like, but it says in Exodus chapter 20, I'm like, whoa, God, thank you for blessing me and reminding me of your word. There was a story, and, I, and I've shared this once before, of a, of a leader 
in a church that was ready to quit. And they go to their, their pastor and they ask the pastor, they said, sir, I'm, I'm ready to turn this in. I'm ready to resign. And uh, the pastor said, uh, well, hold on. Um, I, I want you to do something for me before I accept your resignation. For the next two weeks, I need you to read a daily devotion every day. I need you to take time and listen to worship music that really cultivates an atmosphere for him. But but I need you to read his word. Take a devotion, whatever it may be that helps you read the Bible. Because I get it. Sometimes you could just, you know, if you were me, just open it's like, Lord, is this what you want for me? And it's, it's hard to sometimes read the text when you can't really receive the revelation of what the text may say. And the Bible has so much context also in what was being delivered in that moment, in that message. And it was written in a time where it was not in today's time frame. So we, we, are, we have to a lot of times re, re, uh, uh, depend on a, on a revelation of God's word to say, hey, look, some of us take it literal. Some of us were like, God, you just spoke to me in a sense. And, and so it may be difficult at times, but he says, take a time and read a daily devotion. And after those two weeks, come back and let's sit down. He said, if you still want to quit, I'll accept your resignation. Young man comes back and he he busts through the door and says, Pastor, I don't want to quit. I I don't want to resign. He's like, what happened? He was like, I got vision. I'm excited again. I got my fire back. Jesus has been speaking to me. And it's amazing how in a moment where we call out to God, where where we get into his word, how things begin to change. My my wife shared a story with me this past week how my my daughter was trying to figure something out and she was talking to her and they were in the car and and she was, Mom, I ended up looking up to this and I was so curious and I looked up this and this and and she kept going until she figured out what it was to to, to explain whatever it is that they were talking about. And my my wife looked at her and says, Oh my God, you are your your, your father's daughter. I love to research something and just keep going and going and going until I understand everything that it is on why it happened, the period it happened in, this and that. And a lot of us get excited for things like that. That, but not for the word of God. And the thing is, is that we're lost, we're confused, we're, we're just kind of living life day to day, all numb to the things, but we're not taking the time to go seek his word, a word that's written. Psalms 119, uh, 107, David speaks out and says, I am afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. According to your word. See, the word revived him. He had to go to the word to be revived. You're listening to the word, but let us not just be hearers of the word. Let us be doers of the word that I take this and take it home and keep researching. And man, pastor said that one verse, I got to read the whole chapter. I don't want to just stick on just that one. What is it that you were trying to say that we start falling in love with his word? Psalms 86, 5 says, You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. See, my my kids have learned that when they ask their mom for a little, she wants to give them a lot. Last night, we went and picked up the Lord's chicken, Chick-fil-A. You know, we're working outside, this and that, and, and, and the little one had already ate. But we come home with the bags, and he's like, Where's mine? You know, a little three-year-old. He's where's mine? I want chicken. Ah, he starts going off. And you're like, but you already ate. Like, we know he's full. We know him. Like, you know, he's going to eat it. And you know, just immediately. She's like, no. So what does mom do? She goes, mom, you can have my chicken. I was like, babe, you need the protein. You know what I'm saying? Like, we've been outside all day. I doubled up on my meal. And she's over here with her 10 piece. And she's like, or 12 count. No, you had the eight count. She had the eight count. She was like, here, Jovan, here's the four. And he's like, no. I want my own. He wanted the whole thing. So Maria's slowly eating. And I'm looking at her like, eat it. Right? Like, you know, just eat it. Forget him. You know what I mean? I'm the, the father. Forget him. No empathy. No, no, you already, I saw you. You were eating and I didn't. You didn't offer me any mac and cheese when you were eating it. Where are you? You know. Pray for me. 
my kids have learned that when they ask their mom for a little, she wants to give them a lot. Why? Because Maria can't help it. When we position ourselves to be dependent on God, his posture is one of abundance. When we lean on him and trust him, his desire is to richly bless us, to do good things for us. Whatever your circumstances, something always happens when we call out to God. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answers, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. See, this saying also draws us back to the shepherd analogy of John chapter 10, verse 10 and 11, and then 14 and 15 and 16 around there, where it says, the thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then he says in verse 14, almost the same thing. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. See, Jesus is not only painting a picture of how he defends and leads his sheep, but he's also foreshadowing his death on the cross. But if this is true, why do we still struggle in life? Why do we still endure pain? Why do we still have heartaches? Because this life is not the point. This life is not our ultimate goal and does not encompass the entirety of who we are. This life is a mere drop in the ocean of eternity and serves as the starting block on the marathon that leads us to our goal of eternal life. We can slow it down. We can spend time, money, and energy working to fight against it, but we can't stop it from marching forward. My son, he put on the calendar. We have our family calendar shared, and it popped up, and it was like, uh, what did it say, son? It was like, he put... Something on January 1st, 9,999. I was like, son, we're not going to get to see that. He's like, yeah, it's a reminder for 9,999. I was like, I'm going to be dead. You're going to be dead. Your kid's going to be dead. Your kid's kid's going to be dead. We're not going to be here. I said, as a matter of fact, son, no one's going to even remember our name. And Jelani was like, man, that sucks. Like, wow. Like, no one's going to remember us? No, son. (laughs) We're, we're just going to be like a, just in, a, in a tomb or wherever we're going to be. No one's going to remember this moment right now 5,000 years from now. It's going to be gone from existence. When you think about it like that, it sounds kind of morbid. It's like, man, that's, what's the point? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you remember your great, 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 great grandfather's name on your mom's side? Who goes first? Do you remember your, <laughs> it's like, no, we don't. I have no idea that 10 generations ago, potentially someone fell on their knees and said, Jesus, I'm believing that my descendants through the choice I make right now is in your hands that someone will preach the gospel six, seven hundred years from now. I have no idea if someone in my family made that choice and started a legacy that I'm living today that someone else trailblazed for us to stand here today to say that the Lopez family, if that was our name back then, will worship the Lord. Your choices today will always impact your tomorrow. We may never see it. But man, when you hold that weight to be like, my choice for salvation can influence generations. The power of my yes. The choice. See, Jesus is teaching us to not really be concerned with with is not this life, but eternal life. The the scriptures speak often of the life to come after our life on this earth and that we follow the voice of our shepherd, that we can grasp 
what, what that eternal life is in here and now. And we can live this life in such a way that we are not chasing things that don't last, but chasing the things that do last and have eternal significance. The, this type of life has eternal impact, not only for us, but for untold others around us. See, when Jesus reserved, refers himself as the way, the truth, and the life. He's not giving us a better way to live our lives through him. He is showing us that through following him daily in faith, he will lead us to a better, richer, more meaningful life than we could ever find on our own. See, Jacob's journey to Egypt with his entire family was a critical hinge point in the history of the Jewish people. And to better understand what was going on in the big picture of God's plan, we have we have to go back to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. And back when Abraham was still referred to as Abram, God spoke to him and said similar words that we just heard at the beginning, where he said, Abram, you will live to an old age and die in peace, but I solemnly promise that your descendants will live as foreigners in a land that doesn't belong to them. They will be forced into slavery and abused for 400 years, but I will be the judge of that nation whose servants they are, and they will come out from among them with great wealth. See, Jacob knew the promise made to his grandfather. He also knew that some way, somehow, his people would wind up as slaves in a foreign land for 400 years. Knowing that prophecy, could you imagine the thought process if he lived paranoid to be like, you're telling me to go to Egypt? Uh, Egyptians, I don't think, like us. There's some certain things that are happening there. Would I be the one that's about to kickstart a prophecy that you gave to my grandfather? And is this going to happen just as you said? But I don't think Jacob understood how important his decision to move to Egypt was. I don't believe he knew his decision was part of God's overall plan. And as Jacob and his family moved to Egypt, it set the miracle in motion for his family to fall into slavery to the Egyptians. Whether he knew it or not, something worth bringing out is that he was in this moment operating in a family stage of life. God's original promise to Abraham was to make him a great nation. And several years and two generations later, they were blessed, but they were still just a family. God reiterated to Jacob that someday his family would become a nation. And the Bible tells us that there were 70 people in Jacob's family. That's in Genesis 46, 27. A family with 70 members is a pretty big family, but it's far from being a nation. My point is that Jacob's family of 70 under pressure of 400 years of bondage under the Egyptians would come out as millions of people who would then form the nation of Israel that we stand and support today. God promised they would become. If you want to know the history of, of, of Israel, Palestine, just read your, your Bible. That's it. 400 years of slavery under the Egyptians. 400 with a promise to say we will become a great nation it doesn't look like nation when I'm being whipped on my back it doesn't look like nation when I'm being told what to do it doesn't look like nation when I keep seeing bad news after bad news it doesn't look like nation when I'm being said what to eat and how to drink and whatever it may be it doesn't look like the promise that you said God it doesn't look like it I don't see it. See, Jacob and his family had to belong to Egypt in order to kickstart the nation that God was putting together. I don't know if for someone here, it may look small right now. It, it may feel small right now. It may hurt a lot right now. It may be confusing right now. It may not make sense right now but when God makes a plan he never changes his mind he doesn't have a plan B for you see the message of the New Testament is that Jesus had the right to the throne of David and he was the Messiah through Abraham the miracle is always moving the choices you make today will always impact what you do and see tomorrow see the last two weeks of my message I've shared the same thing that the greatest thing God gave you was choice it's choice you chose to wake up this morning and come to church today 
you're choosing to still sit here and listen to this in this moment as we close. It's choice. And many of us have people that we know and love who are closest to us that don't know Jesus. And I'm encouraging you to fulfill your ministry. There's something inside of you that's burning. Be an example to him. Live as so God has called you. Don't give up. See, many of my biggest issues are that I so often don't follow Jesus and his plan on my life because I'm distracted by the things that are around me and that focus on the mission he has for me. I want to encourage you to think about what God has given you, who God has given you, and what he has called you to do and to fulfill that mission. God knows what he is doing. Embrace the grace. And always know the miracle is always moving. It's always moving. So Father, we just come to you in this moment as we close. And well, that we're encouraged today that something that happened so many years prior leading to the point of Jesus turning himself in. That things had to happen. But through the entire lineage, the whole timeline to arrive, up to your birth, to your death, to your resurrection, and to where we're at today, your miracle has always been moving. That when you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you thought of me. You thought of us. And Lord, as we accept your word in this moment and that's able to be, I can rest in our spirit, rest in our soul, rest in our hearts right now, in our minds to do the right thing, to continue, to keep going, to push forward, to step out, to be bold and do what you've asked us to do. Maybe for some of us to surrender, to, to submit, to really say, Lord, I'm here now for you. For others to release, Lord, the guilt and the shame of feeling like they're not worthy enough that all they've gone through or what's happened or what they've done or what's happened towards them is somehow preventing from your love to reach them that no, Lord, they can release that lie and be able to accept your truth. So they can have life and life abundantly in your name. Lord, that we just grow closer to you Lord, as your word says, that you abound in love, Lord, when we call upon you. That we can take the position of David and say, Lord, revive me in this moment according to your word. Revive me, Lord. Father, we're able to touch our hearts, Lord, that you're able to touch our hearts. Areas that no one knows that we could begin healing and releasing all that's holding us back. We could turn to you and make it about you always. But the choice we make now just solidifies and assures just a miracle that's already been moving in our life. Our legacies are in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you could kindly stand to your feet as we close with a moment of, of response. See, maybe you listened to this message today and thought, you know, I don't, I don't know Christ, and yeah, that's a, what a story about Jacob, so powerful. It's a, such a hurrah moment, and the promise that God made to Jacob in that dream or in that vision in Beersheba came to pass. He got to see his son Joseph. There was redemption with him and his brothers. And because of Joseph's status as being in charge of the land of Egypt next to Pharaoh, they were able to eat. They were in famine. They were able to, to, to have everything that they needed. It's such a beautiful story. And 
And he, and exactly how God said it, he died with his son right by his side. His word is never void. What he says, he will do. My favorite verse is 1 Thessalonians 5.24. It's inscribed right on my Bible. And it's just that one word. And though it's so much that he said throughout that chapter 5, but there's just that sentence there that says, the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. And it's like a promise. It's something you hold on to that no matter what I'm facing, if I'm in a sickness right now, saying, Lord, you are faithful. And I know you will do it. Could I say those words until my dying breath? And still trust. God, you are faithful. You will do it. God, you are faithful. You will do it. I, I don't know if four or five hundred years ago we had a, a family member in my dad's side or mom's side that literally said, Lord, you are faithful. You will do it. And it skips some generations of drunkenness and some generations of divorces and generations of infidelities and generate all this stuff. But then, boom, it hits some guy named Carlos Lopez at 13 years old by himself, no family around, and accepted Jesus Christ and his whole life changed. And because of my father's decision, I stand here today. I had to make the decision for myself because you need to understand that you have to make the God of your parents your God eventually. So a lot of us will call mom, mom, I need you to pray for me. And God is saying, pray to me right now. Speak to me. I am the God who hears you and sees you right where you are. He's like, I'm believing that the choice I make today impacts my son, both of my sons, and my daughters tomorrow. They ultimately have to make the choice for themselves. And that choice will impact their children. And how many of us, not realizing the responsibilities we have around us and not making the choice now? If you're single in this room right now, the choice you make today impacts your tomorrow. Don't wait until you get what we see as blessings. To be like, now I'm going to serve you, God. Serve him now. Make that as part of who you are now. So that when whoever God has for you is running right by your side, you're not dragging somebody because I want to go to church, but he doesn't want to or she doesn't want to. If you're married right now, are we doing this together? Or is my wife the one leading the family? Because I just, it's not for me. We find ourselves in a situation like that a lot. And God may be calling you because the word of God says that, 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 that you, man, are the spiritual head of your house. And what happens when you are not leading your house spiritually? The enemy will attack what you love most. Your wife and your children. Like, nah, baby, that's for you. You go, you go do that. I'm going to chill right here. She's trying to hold on to something that you're supposed to be holding on to. God is calling us. Jacob packed everything for one. Jesus gave everything for all. And he says, you have life in me. So I want to give you an opportunity today to really just take it in and be like, am I living my life in a way that's really bringing fruit, that's vivid, that, it, that's like, that shows that it's being edified in a way where it's like good things. It's moving towards closer to Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing myself. Like people see it. People notice that there's, my life is changing. It's being transformed because he's first in my life. Or is it the other way where it's like, I, I desire that. I long for that. I don't know what's happening. Is it another step? I want to give you the opportunity to surrender it all to God today. 
the way Jesus said in the moment to Peter, as we said in the worship, where he said, put your sword away. He says, shall I not carry the cup that my father gave me? Meaning this, I have to do this in order to kickstart something that today we celebrate. It's that important salvation. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Make him your way, truth, and life in this moment. So with every head bowed, every eye closed in this moment, please, just take this moment as we close. We're, we're done. So really, and it's, like, it's this pastor Andres talking to me. Is I'm feeling this tug in my heart to make things right. I don't want to live in shame. I don't want to feel live in guilt. I want to do the right thing. I want to live a life that's full and has fulfillment in it. I want to know what my purpose is. Some of y'all know what your purpose is, and you're, you're just shying away or moving away from God and saying, come to me. And if you're feeling that call on your heart and that tug in your heart in this moment, then this calls for you. Make things right with Jesus. He loves you so much. Jesus doesn't remind you of what you've done wrong. He reminds you of what he did for you. He loves you so. What happened to you does not define you. What happened to you is not what you're supposed to live out for the rest of your life. Could it be that God can utilize what evil did? What evil was meant to do, God can extract it and turn it for your good. And as hard as that may sound at times for how bad it may have been, he brings the healing. He is the hope. He is the way. So if I'm talking to you right now and you're saying, Pastor Andres, I, I, I want to I wanna give my whole heart to Jesus. I want to put this into his hands. I can't deal with this no more on my own. I, I want to come back to Jesus. Maybe you've done this before and you're saying, Lord, I need to... I need to start over. I need to start fresh with you, Lord. And God is saying, I'm here with open arms. If that's you, if I'm talking to you, right where you're at, just lift your hands. If that's you saying, P.A., I need to make things right. I want to make things right. I can't live like this no more. I want to be dependent on him, not on a friend. Dependent on him, not on my parents. Dependent on him, not on my pain anymore. I want to be dependent on him. I need healing. I need to live my life. If that's you, if God is calling and tugging your heart, right where you are, just lift your hands. If that's you, I saw those hands already.